Hi, thank you guys for having me. I'm very honored, very humbled to be here. We're actually gonna start with a, a five minute video, just give you a little bit more background before I dive into the, the talk here today.
All right, so the, the main premise of my talk today is through the lens of sport to talk about the, the effect that, or the impact that failure has had on my life and, and how that has made me the athlete that I ultimately became. And instead of thinking of failure as along a different path to success or the opposite path, trying to view failure as being along the same path of success. And so any worthwhile achievement in life, ultimately there are several failures that obviously precede that. Uh, but so often we think of those two things as being exclusive or opposite. So the Xterra race, you got a little bit of a glimpse of it. The Xterra, just to explain what I do, what I've done for, for a living, I say living, but it's for a portion of my living anyways for the last 20 years. It's an off-road triathlon. So it's a, an ocean, the world championship is an ocean swim. It's an off-road mountain bike, about 30 kilometers, about close to 20 miles, and then a 10 kilometer trail run. So it's long enough that you can pay the price for going too hard, you can bonk, you need nutrition, but it's also short enough that you have to go at a really high intensity the whole way. So it's a pretty exciting form of racing. So the World Championship, you can see from the elevation profile that there's quite a bit of climbing. There's about 3,000 vertical feet of climbing on the bike and about another 1,000 feet of climbing on the run. The swim can have a pretty big shore break. That's right on the north shore of Maui. And there's typically about an eight-foot shore break right there. And just to make it interesting, they have us go out and come back, run on the beach, go out and come back again. It's about a 1,500-meter swim. Uh, so definitely uh, can be some adverse conditions just with the water and then also the competitors you know, punching and kicking you um, or the other way around, hopefully. Um, so then about six, eight miles into the bike, this is Razor Ridge. We've climbed about 1,500 vertical at that time and there's a thousand foot drop on each side, just kind of an iconic view from the race course there. And then some years, we can have torrential rains. It's right kind of on a break point in Maui where there's you know, a huge um, region of rain on one side and then a drier climate on the other. So some days, it's, some years it's dry, some years we get stuck with conditions like this. So you never know for sure what you're gonna get. Uh, then the run, we start right off climbing. Again, we have about 1,000 feet of climbing on the run and then we finish on the beach. So the last 400 meters or so is on beach sand. So the reason that I'm able to talk to you guys today primarily is that I won the, the Xterra World Championship in 2015. So the only American to win that race in the last 20 years. Um, and it was a pretty special day for me. This is um, two of my three children crossing the line with me. Uh, but what that race uh, did for me, you know, instead of, I'll talk later about a goal not being a destination, but a direction. Um, I had a totally different uh, feeling when I finished that race that I thought I would have. I mean, yes, I had that, that high from the race, but it also caused me to do a lot of reflecting um, on everything that had happened in my life to, that had gotten to me, gotten to me that, to that point. But it also humbled me in a, in a different kind of way. Um, even though I had reached my ultimate goal, I also had the sense that I was the best on that day, um, but that's all that that was. Um, and so, it just really changed my perspective on things. And one thing that I like to say when I approach any race, and I definitely felt that going into this race, is that everything that I had done in my life prepared me for that event. And the reason I say that is I'm often asked, how long have you been training for this? And I like to respond my whole life because I look back at all those, those hardships or all those failures, um, you know, all the adversity I had, been through and that's what really formed that that mindset you know not that a race is 100 percent mental but i think applying that mindset to all of your training and all of your racing takes time to nurture takes time to develop and every life experience gets you there uh, this photo the reason i chose this uh, this is ryan shea um, that's next to me and this is when i was we were in fifth grade and ryan went on to win uh, four state championships in the state of michigan it's never been done before um, he is one of the best uh, marathoners in the country, and he died tragically in the, the 2008 Olympic trials marathon in New York City. It might have been 2007. Um, but the shoes that I was wearing on the beach here was the, the Ryan Shea 
um, XC, and that was just a tribute to him. And the reason that I am bringing him into my talk is to explain that oftentimes athletes and really performers in, in anything, they have different trajectories. And so just because somebody lacks some of that initial promise, there's no way that someone else can determine for them what their ultimate potential might be. So Ryan had a very fast trajectory, but he also had a tremendous work ethic. Even when he was an elite racer, um, he worked harder than anybody else in the country. And so he would be more an exception to that rule, I would say, um, where my trajectory was very slow. Obviously, it took me 15 years to win the world championship, but it, you know, it took me probably 15 years to get to the, that initial point. Um, and that was everything else in my life that had, had preceded my entire triathlon career. So when I had won that world championship, I was you know, looking back and, and the, the most consistent theme in my life was that I was not successful at most of the things that I did initially. And that's why I continued to, to have that drive. And what I just kind of observed is some of, you know, some of those peak performers in my younger years or even my, in the collegiate um, team that I was on, you know, they achieved a certain amount of success. Maybe they had satisfaction from that and then they moved on to something else in their life. And I always felt that I had more to give. And these are just kind of some examples. You know, my eighth grade basketball team, we lost every single game. And they say that losing builds character and we had a lot of character, <laughs> but we didn't have, a, didn't have a whole lot of skill, didn't have a lot of good coaching. Uh, but that, that same starting five, when we were seniors in high school, we won 20 out of 22 games. It was the most in school history. And I came from a really small town, so it was the same kids from, from kindergarten through 12th grade. And so it wasn't like we had, you know, went to a bigger school and had all this talent come in. It was that same ragtag group of kids and I just we had that I had that theme in my life that just kind of continued even into my professional racing career the first Xterra that I did I didn't have initial success I was actually much worse than I thought I would be I thought oh, I you know I, I'm in really good shape I'm the fastest runner I've, I've been in my life and I'll, I'll just you know crush this race and I didn't swim well had a panic attack I didn't know how to mountain bike I didn't have the skills and my run, which was my strength, I was completely exhausted, and I just suffered on the run and you know, had one of the slower runs in the race. And so then I came back one year later and did that same exact course 45 minutes faster. And then two years after that, that, would have been, that was my first professional win in a very international field, and it was kind of a, a come out of nowhere win. And that's where I first thought that, that maybe I could compete on the highest level with, with some of these people. And so what I, the point that I want to make is that if you don't have the courage to fail or you don't have the, the courage to even try, then it's only going to do one thing for you, and that is that you'll never find your fullest potential. You'll never even come close. So I threw this up here. Michael Jordan, he's got a, a, a good story of failure being cut from his varsity basketball team was he, when he was in 10th grade. Um, but everybody sees the successes and they don't always see the failures. And I just like this quote, I've missed more than 9,000 shots in my career. I've lost almost 300 games. 26 times I've been trusted to take the game winning shot and missed. I failed over and over again in my life and that is why I succeed. So what is failure? Ultimately, I really believe that failure can be learning and that's what it should be. There's an ancient Japanese proverb, fall, town, fall down seven times, stand up eight. And initially I thought that would be a really good slide, look kind of cool um, to put, up, put on this, and it kind of goes with the theme of perseverance. But I think that failure is more than that. It's not just about falling down and standing up. I mean, that's, that's determination, that's perseverance, that's important. But if you really want to learn from your failures, there's another step, right? And so that's how you're going to ultimately improve. And so that leads me to the next concept, the growth mindset. And this is being taught in the schools a lot, and so a lot, maybe some of you are familiar with this. Uh, but one, an important point I want to make is that the, the growth mindset is not something that somebody claims to have. So nobody owns a growth mindset. It's something 
that you strive to be. So it's a continuum. So the difference, so Carol Dweck, a researcher, she found that there are two competing mindsets that determined achievement. Um, and this is looking at you know, school age all the way to adulthood. And the fixed mindset is the belief that most of your traits, most of your intelligence, most of your abilities are largely fixed or at least your potential to improve those abilities are fixed based on genetics, right? And so that's a fixed mindset. And the growth mindset is the belief that your inherent abilities, your athletic or your intelligence, um, those things are not known and they can't be known. Um, and so you, the implication is that you have the potential to change those things. And, and that's the, the underlying thing is that the growth mindset, you kind of get out what you put into it. And it ends up being more of a, a self-fulfilling prophecy. What they found is the fixed mindset, yeah, they, those abilities, they do stay fairly static. But people that adopt the growth mindset actually do improve. And they were, you know, they were talking about you know, something as simple as the IQ test, which originally was developed not to assess someone's intelligence, but assess areas that need to be improved. And so Carol Dweck, this researcher that was researching the growth mindset, when she was in grade school, they sat people at tables according to the IQ that they tested at on day one when they showed up. And so talk about a fixed mindset, and these kids would carry that with them their whole life. So the highest, you know, one of the higher achieving kids that sat at the the wrong table, she thought that she was not smart and was dumb for the whole rest of her life because she had been labeled that. And so when, you, when it comes to all different aspects of life, someone with a fixed mindset tends to avoid challenges. And the whole thing is that they, if they fail at something, then it kind of labels them as somebody who's not smart or not fast or not strong. And so they don't want to be perceived as, as that. And so they will avoid challenges at all costs, avoid failure at all costs. And along with that, they need to look like things come easily to them. And so the fixed mindset, they don't ever want to uh, act like that something takes a lot of effort. And so the growth mindset is the opposite of that, where they realize that they get out what they put into it, and they realize that things take effort and things can be improved. And so that's the, the, the whole idea, but it just has Im implications across all parts of life. And you know, through the lens of sport that I'm talking about, um, for me, you know, I was about a year, year and a half younger than most of the kids in my grade. And so I always thought that I was slow, I was weak, and you know, trying not to you know, carry that in my mind even into adulthood has been tough. I mean, it did give me the idea that I could improve those things, but I still have that in my mind. I have to tell myself, like, maybe I am as talented as anybody else, or if I work a little harder at something, I can get better at something. You know, instead of saying, well, I'm, I've got decent endurance, but I'm not fast, so I'm not gonna work on my sprinting. Like, if I wanna get faster, then I should work on my sprinting. So I'm gonna skip ahead a couple of these. Um, so, with that growth mindset, you can, you can view obstacles as opportunities. And what I mean by that is that any kind of setback that you have in your life, for me, it's been knee surgeries, um, you know, anything that, that impacts your training, that can, that's adversity, right? And so that's the way that you deal with that is going to make all the difference. When you're talking about failing and succeeding, it's not about always having that enforcement, you know, that winning is everything and winning is the only thing. You're only gonna learn from your failures. So having that intermittent reinforcement is the most important. So by intermittent reinforcement, it means, you know, not winning every time and actually having the optimal challenge. And so that means trying to find, I should have the, the flow channel, which is trying to find that optimal challenge. So in sports, it might mean going into a workout with maybe a 50% chance of success or failure, where you might not actually succeed at the task that you're attempting. 
And if that challenge is way too high, then it's going to create a lot of anxiety. And if it's way too easy, it's going to create boredom. So when I was, when I had had my fifth knee surgery, my wife was pregnant with our third child. Um, and I'd already had a pretty fulfilling athletic career. Um, but I knew that I still had more to give. I knew that I hadn't reached my full potential. And so I decided to go back to school and get my master's degree. And this, this was just a, a list of some of the 20-page papers that I wrote you know, and researched. And I kind of took a selfish approach to it, but I wanted to find out, I wanted to demystify elite endurance training. And I didn't have the luxury of training 25 to 30 hours a week like most of my competitors. My life was a little bit busier. I wasn't state funded. You know, a lot of the athletes in, in Europe and other countries are, are state funded and they're, you know, they don't have a family, they don't have a job, and so they can train like professional athletes, they can recover like professional athletes. And that wasn't an option for me, so I had to optimize the training process. And so trying to develop a, a better strategy of training, optimize the process, um, and not just train more and train harder. And so you know, even though I had that big setback of another knee surgery, I tried to take advantage of that opportunity, and I knew that my career was limited, and so I followed that tra trajectory for the next five years, and finally winning that world championship. This is just kind of to, to show you the, the chaos, not just juggling two or three sports, juggling five, six sports, having a, a family life. Oh, hold on. The next topic I want to talk about is grit. So how do you develop grit? Actually, let's go back one slide. So this, this photo, the year after I won that world championship, I'd kind of toured the world and was kind of enjoying myself a little bit. And I decided to say yes to everything. And I was, I was racing across the world. And um, I was in Mexico five weeks before this race. And I had an emergency appendectomy. I had my appendix removed in Guadalajara. And so then I was, I was laid up again. And I had the most important race of the season here. And in typical fashion, I got out of the swim about two minutes behind. Swimming is my weakness. Um, and I just clawed my way back into that race and got a little bit closer on the bike, um, got off the bike with maybe a minute deficit. We start off with a four mile climb on the run. And I got within about 30 seconds at the top of that climb. And then we had a two mile single track descent. And on that descent, I fell down twice, right on my face, um, got back up, kept chasing, you know, kept coming in within about 10 seconds then falling again, um, you know, just hanging it all out there. And then with 200 meters to go, I still had about a 10 second deficit. And so I passed um, Braden Curry in the finish shoot and we had been battling back and forth all year. Um, and so my point is that I had a lot of chances to give up. I had a lot of chances to settle for second place. And so that's what I, when I talk about grit, that's what I'm talking about is, you know, having that not just self-belief, but that work ethic that you don't finish. You, know, you don't stop when, the, when you're tired, you stop when the race is over, when you cross that finish line. Um, interestingly, he, uh, he, he tried to slide with his, um, let's see, he tried to, oops, let's go back. He tried to slide with his timing chip on his front foot, but it was actually on his back foot. So, <laughs> so I beat him by seven hundredths of a second. Um, but my timing chip was on my back foot too. So it's, it's, you always put your timing chip on your left foot so it doesn't get in your gears. Um, but so they didn't have a rule when after that race, and it was about 30 minutes before they decided who won. And since that race, they, they went by the timing chip, but they said, Torso, just like track and field, that's how it's torso. But it was just kind of interesting. So grit. So we talked about growth mindset, and grit is another buzzword. And I don't, you know, love you know some of these buzzwords, but uh, another uh, person, Angela Duckworth, um, did a lot of research on grit, and she's got some great TED talks, and kind of defines grit in a really specific way. I, I grew up son of a carpenter, so grit I thought was the you know, how many uh, pieces of sand and a sandpaper, right? But, um, but grit, is, grit entails working strenuously toward challenges, maintaining effort and interest, 
over years despite failure, adversity, and plateaus in progress. So it's not just working hard, but it's working hard towards a long-term goal and it's staying focused. And the last part of that is actually having passion um, for that. And if, if you're working hard towards something that you're not passionate about, uh, I think that can still be applauded. I mean, that's still persevering, that's still hard work. Um, but without that passion, uh, maybe there's something else that, <laughs> that you should be focusing on. And you know, some people realize that, some people don't. Um, and I'd also go further to say that, that grit, you know, grit is forged through adversity, but I would say it's only forged through adversity. So those obstacles that people may perceive that they have in, the, in their life may actually be a huge benefit when it comes to developing grit. And so what Angela Duckworth found was that there was a, there's a quality in children that they were having a hard time identifying um, you know, people that ended up being higher achievers, and this is what she defined as that quality, it was that grit, and, and, and we know this, I mean, it's, it's working hard, right, towards a goal, but she defined it, and she, you know, proved it in research, and so it's a pretty cool thing, but if, if you don't have that kind of adversity in your life, it may mean seeking out that challenge, you're seeking out that adversity. One thing that I always worry about myself is that I'm getting too comfortable. So I have all these, these little things that I, that I do, so I'm not too comfortable. I, before that world championship, I ate the same thing for breakfast, same thing for lunch for 15 years um, because I didn't want to you know, give myself you know, too many luxuries or too many things that I liked. So it's you know, things that you do, mind games that you play with yourself to, you know, in, a, in a cushy, you know, advanced world that you can still have a little bit of adversity, a little bit of grit. So coincidentally, this is that same guy, Braden Curry. Um, this is a, a year later in New Zealand. This is summer in New Zealand. Um, it was January in New Zealand. They had a surprise snowstorm. But this is the Red Bull Defiance Adventure Race. It was a two-day adventure race, and this is day two. We started off in the paddle, but we were on the same team. So we, you know, after our, our big rivalry and you know, talking some smack uh, throughout the season, we put our differences aside, we joined forces, and we, we won this race by over 30 minutes. And it was just, just a kind of a, a, a cool thing to, to lay down the arms a little bit and, and do something on the same team. So don't stop when you are tired, stop when you are done. Um, one thing I, I skipped over on one of those slides, when I was in 10th grade, I got lapped on the track in the two mile, and I was forced to drop out of the race. And so to this day, that's the only race that I haven't finished. And so this is more about a promise that I made to myself when I was 14 years old that I was going to finish the race. And it drives me crazy that a lot of elite athletes will drop out when they're out of the prize money, or they drop out um, when they don't wanna be seen in the results. Um, so I always say, you finish the race and you don't stop when you're tired, you stop when you are done. And this is from 2010. Uh, I had multiple flat tires. I think I had four flat tires on the, on the bike and so I wasn't just taking my wheel off to look cool but I actually couldn't ride the bike anymore, <laughs> I tried. Um, and so I ran the last like six miles of the bike and kept running on the run. All right, so goal setting. I touched on it earlier that goals, goals are a direction, but they're not a destination. And part of it is, you know, those long-term goals, they can guide you along that path, um, but hopefully you'll be adjusting those goals as you go. I mean, possibly you might set something that's way too lofty, um, or you might be limiting yourself. And that's, you know, talking about reaching your potential, you can have, you know, a moving goalpost. You know, you can have goals that you reach and set another goal. When you set those goals, there's, there's three basic types of goals. There's the outcome goals, there's performance goals, and there's process goals. And most often, people set outcome goals first, but outcome goals to depend on other people. And that's really hard in my sport uh, because there's not times that we go by 
there's not the performance goals, there's only the out outcome goals. And I hear a lot of people that I coach say, I wanna stand on the podium, um, I wanna win my age group. And those are great to maybe give you some direction, um, but what we wanna do is flip that. And the most important thing is the process goals because setting goals means nothing if you don't make your goals actionable. So it's what you do that matters and it's what you do on a day-to-day -day basis. So performance goals are second important, second in importance and those you know, are setting maybe the metrics and those might be in training. I wanna be able to you know, run a certain pace for my mile repeats or I wanna hit a certain time in the pool. That would be a performance goal. Uh, but a process goal is I'm going to wake, I'm going to set my alarm clock for 5 a.m. and I'm going to set my swim bag out there and I'm going to go to the pool. And so you have to make your goals actionable or else goals mean nothing. So when, sometimes when reporters ask me, oh, what was your, what's your key to success? What's your key to long-term success? And I give them the most boring response you've ever heard. I say it's a systematic achievement of short-term goals. And like, oh, okay, well, it didn't, it's not what I was looking for, actually. Uh, but that's the truth, is that you're, you're staying focused on the process and you're achieving one goal and then you're achieving another. And I always say that you don't learn anything from winning races because in, with the right mindset, the person who wins the race is the only person who's not sure if they gave it 100%. In theory, everybody from second place on should know that they gave 100% because they were chasing, chasing, chasing all day and giving everything to the tape. And when you win the race, you're like, well, I don't know if I was challenged. I felt like I was going pretty hard, but I didn't have anybody to push me. Um, what was interesting, the, the, the race that, where I had Braden Curry, where I just nipped him at the line there, two years later, there was, I had a, a new rival, Mauricio Mendez from Mexico, and he was on fire and he's about half my age, and we got out of the water. He had a pretty good lead. Well, I didn't know it, but he dropped out of the race, and I passed what I thought was second place, but I was in first place, and I won the race by about four minutes because I thought that I was chasing the whole day. And so that was like the one time where I won the race and I knew that I'd given it 100%. But if, he, if I would have known that I was in first place, I, you know, maybe I would have won the race, but maybe I would have won the race by a minute, and I wouldn't have known what my true potential was. All right, so at the end of the day, failure is learning, and the most important thing is how you respond to those failures that's gonna make all the difference. So stay present, stay focused on the process, encourage effort, just like with that growth mindset. Show, show that effort is important, that it should be championed, be comfortable being uncomfortable, and most importantly, become the best at getting better. Thank you. No questions? You guys are good. Yeah. Can you talk about the role like uh, your family, your mentors play in helping you overcome some of these failures? Because sometimes failures can be amplified if you feel like you're alone or isolated or don't have a support system to fall back on. Yeah, no, I, I, I think that's important. And um, I did have a pretty unique childhood that you, you saw there, uh, you know, very, very simple life. And one of the most important things is that my dad kind of realized, you know, he was the, the football player and he's like, well, this kid's not really, you know, maybe he's got another sport that he might do a little bit better at. Uh, but there was never like the pressure, you know, to, to you know, I, I didn't, I taught, the whole talk is about failure, but although I may, may have felt horrible after some of those things, like I didn't feel like I had like ultimately failed at anything and I didn't have somebody that made me feel like that. And, so, and I did have some, some great coaching along the way, you know, like my high school cross country coach that taught me that you never concede the race to anybody. And, you know, just having those, those little things in your mind that, you know, the never give up attitude. And, and that's why that I continue to pursue sports in general, for sure. Yep. Yeah, uh, I'll tell you, 
Marks and Cadet Squadron 18. Got two questions. One, what was that breakfast and lunch? <laughs> uh, but the other question, uh, for your coaching, you mentioned evidence-based coaching. Can you give us just a little insight of yeah. what you mean by that and maybe what, what that might look like overall? Okay, so there are two questions. The first one, and you might have to remind me the second one by the time I answer this, but um, what, do, what did I have for breakfast and lunch every day? And it's not, it's not glamorous. Um, I, I always say that, um, you know, talking about nutrition is, is kind of like talking about politics, you know, so it's, you know, everybody has these preconceived notions. And, um, but so every morning I would have plain yogurt and granola basically, um, but then I would have, and I actually have it in one of these slides, I had all these containers of like nuts and seeds and raisins and stuff that I would put on it, um, and I labeled, my joke was that I would have a bowl of courage every day. Oh uh, wait, passed it, just passed it over. There it is, so I had, had a bowl of courage. So, um, and then um, my lunch was a peanut butter raisin sandwich and an apple and a banana um, because I would run every, for a couple of years when I lived in Vail, we didn't have a car or we shared a car, my wife and I shared a car and so I'd run everywhere and the peanut butter jelly would just get a little too mushy. So I, I switched to peanut butter raisin. <laughs> and then um, what was the second question? Yeah, coaching. Oh, okay. So. Um, this is a whole nother talk. I have a real scientific lecture on block periodization um, that, I, that I give. But if you, if you Google block periodization, um, you'll probably you know, pull up a lot of um, old like Russian training theory and stuff. And the problem with endurance training is that it's, it's rooted in tradition. And so a lot of the, the periodization model that most endurance athletes follow and coaches follow is from the 1950s, 1960s. And not that there's anything wrong with that, but it works for certain types of events. But the whole premise is that block periodization, it's like mini periodization cycles. And one of the biggest things is that my, my season is like, my competitive season is like nine months long. And so to have like a huge build up, you know, gradually building up volume, then reducing volume, bringing in intensity, didn't really work. So I had to, basically it's condensing those into like five to nine periodization cycles throughout a year. And so the whole bottom, the bottom line is that you can, you train with a little bit more intensity, a little bit less volume, um, but then you, you undulate and you cycle it a lot more. And so it was really just taking a scientific approach and some even, you know, strength athletes have heard of block periodization but hasn't carried over to endurance training. So, but don't tell my competitors that. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, I, I dabble in endurance sports as well, and I've learned that a lot of it's mental. How much, if you were to, I don't know, how would you break that down? How much mental, how much is physical, and then you're really well into endurance sports? Yeah, I, I think the longer you go, the more mental it becomes, for sure. Um, I don't know. I, I do think, I think they're so related that the best way to, you know, forge a stronger mind and to, to work on the mental aspect is through the physical aspect. And so I'm all for, you know, somebody mastering meditation or something like that. But I think that a lot of that ability is tuning into your body in the day to day struggles. And if you're somebody who's, you know, who has a hard time pacing a race, bonks in a race, like as a coach, I want to look at the training files, like how are they competing, completing you know, work out like five times eight minutes at race intensity, are they fading on every interval that they do? Is their power dropping? Is their pace dropping? Um, because most likely the way that you train is the way that you're gonna race. And, uh, I don't know, that's a short answer. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, one thing that's really cool about the growth mindset, well, humans are horrible at estimating their ability in general, but people with a really high growth mindset are really good at it. So if you say, you know, how, if you go run five miles, how fast are you gonna run that? 
Um, you would think it would be the opposite. You'd think somebody with a high growth mindset would be like, oh, I can do this so good. You know, I'm going to be so much better in three weeks. But they actually get really good at, at estimating their ability because they're grounded in reality. And it's because you're taking feedback from every performance. So somebody who has a, a fixed mindset, um, they don't take criticism well, and they, they get angry, agitated, and they take it personally. Um, where somebody with a high growth mindset, they want to know um, every flaw. So like if I go and do a swim lesson, swimming is my weakness in the three sports, and I want to know everything I'm doing wrong. Like I don't want to go do a swim lesson and have somebody tell me, oh, it looks pretty good. You know, like, oh, you got a really good high elbow catch. I don't think you need to work on that. I want to, no, I want to hear, you know, 10 things that I'm doing wrong so that I know I can improve all of those things. Is that that? Is that what you're asking? I think so. <laughs> yep. Yeah, I think so. I'm a parent. I have three kids, and you know, I'm involved in in some of their sports stuff, some of their school stuff, and you know, just. A lot of, um, and I think it's more of a modern problem, but parents tend to create environments around kids so that they guarantee their success. And so setting up things where they don't fail at things and they're doing a huge disservice to those kids. And I mean, no, you don't want to, you know, say, oh, you're terrible, uh, you know, at, at something. And so one thing as a, as a, parent as a coach, as an educa educator, realizing that some people do have those fixed mindsets and they're a little bit more fragile. And so you need, you might need to start off with something positive, a compliment, and then give some constructive criticism. And somebody with a really high growth mindset, they want to know exactly what they're doing wrong and how they can make it better. And realizing that there's people at both ends, um, but ultimately if you're setting up every scenario so everybody's successful, then you're doing a huge disservice to them. Yeah. When you talk about being uh, comfortable with being uncomfortable, have you ever considered doing a crazy long run like the Leadville 100 just for fun? <laughs> um, so I've really tried to, to stay in my lane a little bit when it comes to sports, and it's really hard to, I'm really tempted by a lot of long things. Um, I'm going to say no for now, but it's not as hard of a no as I used to give. Um, last summer I did the, and I can't actually talk about it because it hasn't aired yet, but I did the Eco Challenge adventure race. They brought it back after 17 years, but Eco Challenge is 417 miles in Fiji, and it was continuous through the night. It was, you know, paddling, mountain biking, running. Um, there's like seven different disciplines, but, you know, sleep deprivation. We went like... We, one time we went 60 hours without sleeping and you know moving the whole time, which is a mistake. Should not do that. <laughs> um, but I mean, those things are so tempting and it's so hard for me, but I have to say no to a lot of those things. Would you talk about sleep and uh, sleep deficits for all of us as either athletes or professionals? Yeah, um, I, and this is just, I'm not a sleep expert, but Consistency, like with your biorhythms, for me is, is very important. And having a pretty normal go to sleep time, a pretty normal wake up time. Um, but, you know, I live, my kids are out of school this week, and I've been, so then staying up a little bit later, but I still have to get up at 5 a.m. And I, for an athlete, I think as long as I can consistently be getting seven hours, then that's pretty good for me. I crave eight and would love an occasional nine hours of sleep. Um, but it doesn't always happen. But I think, and you know, I, I think that cadets probably have an even busier lifestyle most of the time. And um, but you know, consistency with those biorhythms, I think, is is really important. And then you can have, you can throw in a three, four hour night, you know, and survive it, right? But if it's three, four hour night, several nights in a row, for me, that's that's when I get sick. That's when my body breaks down. Say that one more time. What is something to you that probably that you need to get back that would energize you? 
Yeah, the question is, what is something that I do different to relax? And to be honest with you, I don't have a lot of free time because because my home life trying to dedicate enough, you know, with my kids. But I love doing stuff with my kids. I I have little things that I do with each of them. My daughter, I practice gymnastics with. I read her, you know, a book for 20 minutes every night. My other boy, I play ping pong with in the garage, and uh, you know, just doing those types of things is is what does it for me. But um, I don't know that I'm the best person to talk about life balance with. So, <laughs> it's probably better strategies. I have a guitar that hasn't been played in 20 years that my wife asked me why I don't play, and I said, well, I, it worked. I, I married you. Like it. <laughs> she said, why haven't you played that since we got married? <laughs> All right, well, thank you guys. I appreciate it. <laughs>